So we had the absolute best video to start smacking down this week because it was a recap of everything that's happened with the bloodline over the last few weeks. And we even got Roman Reigns ringing Paul Heyman when the phone went doo doo doo. Paul Heyman can't answer your call. I mean, it didn't say that, but my word did it make me happy. The phone is included in the plot. Also, hello, my friends. It is I, Simon Miller, from another hotel room. I'm in New York City, because literally a few hours ago, I successfully defended my Progress Proceus title for the second time. On a Sunday, I'm going to Chicago to defend it again. So if you are around or you want to watch it on Triller, you can then you can find me on the internet and give me your road down. So I am just having the best time and thank you all for your support. But now it's time to take the American finger of power and give the good bits the up and the bad bits are down. Bianca Belair was the first person out on SmackDown, which did tie in because of course all this week, everybody has been talking about Jade Cargill. Seven days ago, she was found bludgeoned on top of a car. Now some people say she's in for real. And other people say she's not injured at all. This is how wrestling should be, as long as she is mostly okay. Work me, baby. Shouldn't have said that. We then went full WWE 2019, because Naomi's music played, Leo Sky's music played, then Bailey music's played, because she's now in the War Games team. We didn't even get a video for this. It was just like, meh, she turned up on Raw. She could be on War Games with out came Rhea Ripley. And as always, everybody gave her a big pop. So if you're one of these strange people that go, I don't like how Rhea Ripley's being booked, you are, of course, allowed that opinion. But listen to the fans, they love her. Now, Michael Cole did fill us in with all of this. I mean, he may as well have shouted exposition <laughs> through the microphone. Honestly, Rhea wearing this nose mask thingamajig, whatever you want to call it, that is totally badass. She looks like Batman. She also told us that it doesn't actually matter that the good guys war games team don't like each other. Because when it comes to the bad guys war games team, every single person in the ring right now hates one of them. And it will be that rage which fuels them forward. Something. Rhea then said all of the names of the individual enemies and she looked at members of her team when she was doing it when Naomi said they were lap dog. And the definition of that is a small dog you keep as a pet. I don't remember that in the story. Naturally, at this time, the bad guys did arrive because they had been called lap dogs, but also because of wrestling rule 14.8. The first thing Liv Morgan did was go, <laughs> did that laugh she does. It does not sound like that. Nia Jax then made sure to stir the point with a more direct intention because she was like, ah, you talk about us. Every single one of you in the squared circle right now, you've all fallen out with each other. So when we get to the war games, you're probably going to do it again. I mean, she's not wrong. Bailey then played her too because she was like, ah, you don't even respect Tiffany Stratton, who's meant to be your buddy. And because she had mentioned buddies, Nia went, you don't even have any friends. Listen, it was the most lame insult ever. I laugh. We then got into the Jay Cargill stuff, which is the best shot to fire, because Jax was like, uh, excuse me, Bailey, you have benefited very much from this, so maybe you're to blame. When Rhea was like, can we all just shut up and fight? Liv Morgan went no, and they walked away. Of course, thankfully, the baby faces remembered that there isn't a force field around the ring, so we finally did get our big brawl. And that bit was good. We probably should have got to that very, very quicker than we actually did. Because while the rest was fine, I don't know, man, but for new WWE, it did feel a little bit by the numbers. I mean, it just wasn't the best way to sell you on a death match, even though when we get to that cage war death match, it is going to be awesome. But yeah, I don't want to say it was like boring. It wasn't. It was fun enough. And I like each individual character. But I do feel like we could have done more. Therefore, I have no choice. It must get it down. But again, do I really care? No, I am pumped for war game. When Andrade was back on SmackDown, because he still wants a shot at the US title. <laughs> Bill, bro, come here. Let it go, you failed. Now, WWE did sell this the right way because they were like, he is taking on Shinsuke Nakamura because Mr. Tranquilo feels like Shinsuke has come back to WWE and cut the line when it comes to this championship. I mean, that's pretty true. Now, I do have to say something controversial here, so you do have to forgive me, but because Nakamura is evil now, we have remixed his theme song. I'm sorry, my friends, my family, my loved ones. I don't like it. I do appreciate the fact that we have switched some things around because he is super bad guy, but you do not mess with the classics. It's like if I went to have a pizza and somebody had changed the cheese for, I don't know, custard, I'd be really pissed off. It's like, I don't want no pizza with custard. I don't want this. We should have just given him a completely brand new theme. Down. I really do like Nakamura's new get up though. And can you believe it? He actually won here. Now, some people are melting down going, oh my gosh, Shinsuke hasn't been on TV since April and he beat Andrade, but it really doesn't matter. They had a super good match. And again, it's just Nakamura's time right now. In 2025, pretty sure Andrade is going to get his. The goal here as well, of course, was to convince you that maybe, just maybe, Shinsuke Nakamura can win at the Survivor Series. And I guess I'm more convinced than I was at these two, I swear. 
There was this one moment when Shinsuke was about to climb in the ring and Andrade just booted him into the face and gave Shinsuke the moonsault to the outside and Nakamura laid there like he was dead. Because I'm a massive nerd, I actually called the cops. So I really would take an elongated feud between these two any day. Well, of course, Andrade was stuck by the most powerful force in all of sports entertainment the commercial break. When we came back, Shinsuke Nakamura was magically in control. Maybe Andrade had said to Shinsuke, dude, your hair is awesome, which it is, by the way, that kind of pumped Nakamura up and he went at it. They were then fighting on Team of the Turnbuckle when Andrade went to do something in the corner. But when Nakamura got out of the way, he exposed the steel. And honestly, Andrade then went for the double knees and he went flying into this thing. I mean, bless that man. He did not hold back. It was a bit like what Bron Breaker had done on Raw that damn table when Nakamura did hit the Kinsasha. One, two, three. And then I, of course, ran out afterwards to try and get his revenge, but Shinsuke went and blew the black mist in his face because he's evil now. So once again, in terms of building this match up, given we haven't had that much time, I thought they did a decent job. This match totally cooked. So Lizakoa then won the night because he was telling Jacob for two, who was going to face Jay Uso later, listen, you've got this and certainly don't worry about Jay's dancing. Honestly, I acknowledge Solo, he's the best. Nick Aldis then walked in and told the Bloodline 2, but oh, listen, these two are fighting to figure out who's going to have the advantage in the war games. So everybody is banned from ringside. So Kyle went, all right, Nicky. <laughs> so once again, he's my new favorite. We then cut to Tommaso Ciampa. It turned out he was still mad. I was like, dude, you've had a week, you've got to calm down. He was screaming at Johnny Gargano, though, saying, we're not losers, we're not losers, which is something a loser would say. Johnny was like, let me just talk to the machine guns, and I'm sure we can work this out. And Tommaso was like, it's your friendship with the machine guns that is the problem, when Johnny still said he could talk to them, when Tommaso Ciampa turned into a James Bond villain and said, fine, you've got one week, but we're going to do it my way. So that really did feel like murder, although Crazy Ciampa is the best Ciampa. Well, we had this Kevin Owens video. I'm giving it a round of applause because KO turned up to SmackDown and he had the receipts. Because they literally went through every single thing the Bloodline had done to him. And the end point of all of this was they tried to kill me, they tried to kill me, they tried to kill me. He even showed the clip from the Royal Rumble when he got hit with the golf cart. That's what we were all saying on the internet because we're geeks. The best one, of course, was at the 2023 Royal Rumble when the Bloodline totally bludgeoned him because who was in the building that night? Cody Rhodes. And who did not help KO? Cody Rhodes. But what was Kevin Owens doing late in the year? He was helping Cody Rhodes. So you cannot argue it. Kevin is totally right. And he ended this by saying, you know what? The Saturday night's main event, the American Nightmare ends in favor of the Canadian dream. So that's it. He is getting it up. And that even didn't last this long. And as I said on the internet the other day, which broke my social media, I think Kevin Owens should win. That's not because I hate Cody Rhodes. But sometimes I want chaos in my life. I am Dr. Robotnik. Clearly Cody was watching this too and then totally ripped up the running order because he came to the ring because he had fallen out with Carmella Hayes last week. It was time to fight. Now Melo cut a promo as he was walking to the squared circle and was like, I agree with Kevin Owens too because you, Cody, stab your friends in the front. I'm like, well, that's better than stabbing them in the back. If I'm going to get murdered by a knife wound from someone I loved, I want to be able to look them in your eyes as I slowly bleed out and die. We have gone down a very mistaken path. We then got some proper wrestling to begin with, with Cody drop down to the dusty punch, and actually Carmelo got out of the way, which was the biggest waste of time, because Rhodes doesn't did it again, and he got Carmelo slapped him, which was a terrible idea, because he then got thrown out of the ring, and of course Cody did a dive, because if you are a wrestler in WWE, at one point you do throw a wrestler to the outside, and you don't do a dive, everyone's going to think you're stupid. The most powerful force in all of sports entertainment, the commercial break then struck again, because that's when we did return, Carmelo was in control, although WWE actually did catch us up this time thanks to replays, when man, these two mother hubbards did a superplex from the top rope, and Cody held him up there for around about 10 minutes. That's brilliant. Hayes was then able to hit a face buster for a one 2 ooh, but let's face it, that was never going to happen. When Cody clearly had charged up all of his meters, because he stole everybody's finish, he hit a running power slam, and he hit a figure four, Carmelo had to get to the ropes. Now, for some reason, Cody just stopped in time at this point, which allowed Carmelo to boot him in the face, when he started selling that knee. Now, of course, that ties into the first Kevin Owens feud. So, damn it, I think we're going to go Britney Spears, and we're going to do it again. Maybe that's how Kevin wins. Eventually, Hayes took way too long to climb the turnbuckle, though, which is when, of course, Cody hit the Cody cutter. And then pretty much soon after this, he hit the crossroads. One, two, three. But honestly, bless Mello to the bottom of my tootsie toes. He sold this like an absolute champ. So this was just a fun match, and I think it is going to pay off in some funny way in 2024, because Carmelo has now lost twice to Cody Rhodes. 
And of course, we didn't get the big old promo because we still have the pay-per-view first. Let's get it up. When we got to which was essentially the main event segment of the night, at 2106, but who the flub cares? It was the sitting down between Roman Reigns, CM Punk, and Paulus Taven. Now, Heyman started this by toying with his Hall of Famer, which must mean something. And Roman was having a meltdown because he was like, wise man, where is CM Punk? It was like, I don't know, bro. He should be here right now, but he's not. Now, just as he was about to leave, Punk did walk in the room. So that was like he was some sort of magical man with amazing timing. And Roman Reigns just told him, listen, bro, I don't want you helping me at the Survivor Series. And in fact, I straight up hate your guts. And I was like, why didn't you tell him how you really feel? Now, CM doesn't want to do this either. And he was like, why aren't you listening to me, you dingus? This isn't about you, Mr. Tribal Chief. It's only about Paul Heyman. He's my friend, he's my pal, and everything I'm doing right now is for him. Roman then pretended he was all happy about this, and that was like turning up your ex's wedding and go, please marry him, I don't care, which is when we got more barbs, when Paul was like, listen dudes, you two have to get on the same page. Because ever since WrestleMania 40, do you know who has been running wild over Smacker Down? It is Solo Sokoa and the Bloodline 2.0. So if you can't run the team, you're all gonna die, especially you, Roman Reigns, because Solo Sokoa knows you're the biggest threat, so he's gonna come after you. So if you want to survive, which was was very good time because that's the name of the pay-per-view you must come together like lego now punk once again said listen roman this is nothing about you i am doing a favor for your wise man because let's not forget i want to get my revenge against the bloodline 2.0 as well because they threw paul Heyman through alan the announce table and the absolute best part is that punk said when all this is said and done maybe they can sit down and have another chat one-on-one -on -one. the first i was like oh, maybe they're gonna plan a holiday together or something then I realized it was a tease for a few. Now the end part was super important as well because Punk made it clear I am doing this because I get one favor from Paul Heyman, which is when he got up and left. So Roman said, what's the famous bra? The Feyman? The Feyman. What's the favor bra? I mixed two words up there. And Paul Heyman said, let's just get through war games and we can discuss it. I'm sorry. If you watch this and you trust CM Punk and Paul Heyman, well, you were watching a different show to me. So I totally think they're going to ruin Roman Reigns. And to use the word that the internet uses, this was total cinema. It was totally over the top. And it was totally wonderful. There was all like well, was spooky music in the background to make you know this was a big deal. And I love the fact that WWE is experimenting with stuff like this. It was like Goodfellas. That's a wild exaggeration. That's the kind of tone they're going for. And why not do this? We get 52 weeks of programming in a year. I thought it was bloody brilliant to use British slang. I'm totally giving it up. If you want me to get pumped about war games and post war games, that's a good job. The women's US title tournament continued after this because we had Lash Legend, who was replacing Jade Gargill, taking on Meachin and Piper Niven. It was a fun match. Now, as we know, Chelsea Green should win the whole thing, and she did indeed come out with Piper Niven. <laughs> that didn't matter at all because Meachin had decided, man, I am going to run wild. But she was also confusing. Because when she was doing her entrance, she found a sign in the crowd that said Mia Yim, and she held it up and was like, look at this. But if you'd never watched SmackDown before, you'd be like, why is Meechin holding a Mia Yim sign? And who the flub is Mia Yim? Piper Niven then crushed her with her crossbody almost instantly, so Lash Ledger broke up at the one, two, ooh. She just picked these people up like there were nothing. And listen, all three were very good here, but I mean, they did have to pick an MVP but most definitely be Lash. Meechin also did this awesome top rope Hurricane Rana that Lash sold like she had been absolutely murked when Meechin also did a spring soap moonsault to the outside. I was like, oh yeah, she's really good. Sometimes she vanishes from TV and I forget. Chelsea then panicked, so she attacked Meechin. As Michael Cole told us, there's no DQs in three ways. So my hand went up. I was like, well, if that's the case, why doesn't Chelsea just get involved the entire time? But we will never know because V Fab walked out and she took out Chelsea Green, not to dinner. And Piper Niven, being a wrestler watching wrestlers outside the ring, she couldn't handle this and she distracted herself. She then turned around and Legend booted her right in the face. And I got to tell you, Lash just being thrown in the deep end on SmackDown has worked out so well. I enjoy her more and more every week. She kept breaking up pins too, which told me she probably wasn't going to win when her and Piper just crashed into each other. So once again, if you were just looking for some entertainment, exhibit A. Never then got the Vader bomb, but Meechin broke that up at the one two when Lash Legend hit this death backbreaker and choke slammed Piper Niven. Once again, I was like, yeah, Lash, my girl. She also turned to the ref and went, man, you can't count when somebody else kicked out. So once again, that was another tick box when she hit the bomb of power onto Meechin. Lash Legend is great. Meechin and Piper then found themselves battling on top of Tina the Turnbuckle, but Legend realized that was a bad idea, so she stopped them. So Piper, she tried to go for the senton, but she totally missed. 
when Lash Legend leveled up. She hit the Lash Extension, which is the worst name for any move in the history of all of the moves. And just as she was about to win, she got screwed because of those meddling kids. Or Meechin came off the top rope. She crushed both of them, but she doubly crushed Piper, who was on the bottom, and she pinned her. One, two, three. So I really did enjoy this. I mean, it was nothing to write home about, but that would be weird anyway. If you write to your mum telling her about wrestling, she's going to be like, man, tell me about your life, you stupid kid. But it does mean that Meechin goes through to the next round. I think she deserves it for no reason whatsoever. That's just how I feel. Uh, we then got a medical update with LA Knight who was having his eyes washed. When Byron Saxon walked in, I was like, whoa, are you still going to be fighting to fight at the Survivor Series? It's like, Byron, it's clearly not the time. LA Knight agreed, and of course, this makes no difference because at the pay per view, he is going to whip Shinsuke's ass. And look, I'm 99% sure he will walk away with the LA title, the US title, that is not the name of the belt. But do I have that 1% doubt in my tum tum? Probably. That's a good job. Goji Bloodline sans Roman Reigns were then getting G'd up when, of course, Nick Aldis walked in and said, <laughs> you guys are banned from ringside too. And honestly, the look on Jimmy Uso's face here, that guy is just funny. Jacob Fatou then also came out doing his thank you emoji pose. And that's when I was like, man, this is why the Bloodline walks so well, because every single person has a personality. And we did get to our proper main event, and it was to figure out who's going to get the advantage in the men's war games match. I was surprised because the very first thing they did lock up then I was like, well, they are cousins. Then I was like, are they cousins? I don't know anymore. His family tree goes too deep. It was also Jacob's first ever one-on-one -on -one match in WWE, so put that in your brains. When Jey Uso knocked him out of the ring and he went for a dive, of course it went totally wrong because one, Fatu watches the show, and two, he is Jacob Fatu. He just grabbed this guy and he totally murked him. He was dead. He then stared into the camera to trigger the commercial break, which is quite the power. When we did return, they were just punching each other in the face when Jacob Fatu beheaded Jey Uso. But once again, I was like, I think someone needs to check on him. He's not moving. Once again, here's another guy that just has amazing facial expressions. And when he went to get in the corner, Jey Uso got out of the way, meaning Fatu went into reading the ring post. And then it happened twice. So all of a sudden, he was in trouble. Jay then did the yeet punches, but Fatu is so good, he came back with the most ludicrous flip thingamajig you'd ever see because he could do anything. When he made a mistake, he went, I love you, Solo. Shouldn't have done that. He got super kicked. It actually didn't matter at all, though, because Fatu then just popped up and hit that Samoan drop. And I checked people, it's okay, he's most definitely Samoan. But he didn't miss the senton because the Uso got his knees up. But man, Jay hit him with a spear and he hit him with the Uso splash. Jacob kicked out at the one 2 -oo. I tell you, I have been treated worse by some of my girlfriends than WWE treat Jacob Fatu. That's my new dream. Jay then did do this awesome dive. It was a bit like Darby Allens, and it was so much power behind it, they wrecked Allen the announce table. But actually, that went really bad for Uso because Jacob just shrugged this off. He took his med pack and he hit another Samoan drop, this time into Allen. I suppose this was good because we protected Jey Uso to a certain point when Fatu threw him in the ring. He hit the Impaler DDT and he hit that big old moonsault from the top rope. The bad guys have got the advantage. Now the fans were genuinely upset that Jey Uso lost two, which means he's a wonderful baby face. And yes, this does work for the pay-per-view, especially because it ended with Solo and the Bloodline 2.0 doing the pose. So listen, I'm so excited for that show. And in terms of this SmackDown overall, well, the main event gets an up. Smackdown gets an up too. Now, of course, I shall be back with you on Sunday morning, Saturday night at some point over the next couple of days with that ups and downs. Because I will be wrestling and I am going to Chicago. It's just a very fun time. And I feel very blessed that the ups and downs never stop because I have a problem. That problem is me. That doesn't make any sense. I'll see you soon.